If you are tuning in, we are continuing our series, Run Me My Money, and I do not want to waste time on the formalities. If you would go with me to Mark 8, verse 14 through 21. March 8, verse 14 through 21. When you have it, say amen. On the chat, when you have it, say amen. Go ahead and put amen on the chat like an old church. And it reads, Mark 8, verse 14 through 21 says, But the disciples had forgotten to bring any food. They had only one loaf of bread with them in the boat. As they were crossing the lake, Jesus warned them, Watch out! Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. At this, they began to argue with each other because they hadn't brought any bread. Jesus knew what they were saying, so he said, Why are you arguing about having no bread? Don't you know and understand even yet? Are your hearts too hard to talk to take it in? You have eyes, can't see. You have ears, but can't hear. Don't you remember anything at all? When I fed the 5,000 with five loaves of bread, how many baskets of left, leftovers did you pick up afterwards? Twelve, they said. And when I fed the 4,000 with seven loaves, how many large baskets of leftovers did you pick up? Seven, they said. Don't you understand yet, he said. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We welcome you in this place. We ask that Holy Spirit that you speak and that you shut out any distraction, that you teach us, Lord, how to manage our finances your way. And we thank you, Lord, for all the things that you are doing. While we are talking to you right now, we pray for the Orlando Magic that you will help them in their little losing game that they're having right now. Help them just win one game for us, Lord Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. While you're praying, while you're talking to the Father, you better ask. So today our sermon title is part two or part deux of our financial series called Run Me My Money. And if you have not been tuning in to TKC, please go back and check it out because our pastor has been on one for the past couple of weeks, months, and years. He's always been a good communicator, but I don't know, just these past couple of weeks, he's just been on fire. If you agree, could you let him know that, please? Could you just give praise to our man of God? He's been amazing. And I am so thankful that I'll be able to pick up the mantle and, and, and also grateful that I'll be able to continue this series um, that's called Run Me My Money. By the way, I always wanted to know how to say run me my money or give me my money in every language when I was growing up. Just know how to say it. Just run me, give me my money, you know. Like he said, dame mi dinero. Um, it just feels good when you say it. But if anybody has the right to say, run me my money, it's the Lord. And when we're talking about giving God the finances, amen. What we're talking about is, is, is this series is designed to give a kingdom perspective on how to manage our finances. Note the operative word is kingdom perspective, not Christian perspective. Because when we say kingdom perspective as followers of Jesus, what we're saying is we're not adhering to a bunch of rules or rituals, but we're adhering to a government that is counterculture in the way we handle money. So what I'm going to say to you this morning is going to be counterculture to what you hear in the world because before they, we were called Christians, we were called citizens of heaven. So as citizens of heaven living on earth, we have a different mandate on how we do things. We don't do things the way the world does it. So while I'm speaking to you, I know some of the things I'm going to say your flesh is going to reject because they don't teach this in school because they're not part of the kingdom. That's why our motto is in TKC to follow God, love people, 
and change the city. You're acting brand new. Say it with me. Follow God, love people, and change the city. Because we want to have the kingdom perspective in every aspect of our lives. So with our finances, is nothing different. We want to follow God with our money. We want to change the city with our money, right? We want to love people with our money. Now, some people may say, why are you talking about finances? Let me just give you a few stats. Well, first of all, the Bible talks a lot about finances. Just a few stats. I don't know if they're going to post it on, on the screen. But if you're writing notes, please write this down. The Bible talks a lot about finances. The Bible says approximately there are 500 verses on both faith and prayer. 500 verses on both faith and prayer. But there are over 2,000 verses on money by itself. Faith and prayer, which we all say is important, but over 2,000 plus verses on money and finances by itself. 40% of Jesus' parables was about what? Money. Even further, the money is the third most referenced topic in the Bible. Only third to God himself in the kingdom of heaven because Jesus always said the kingdom of heaven is like this. So if money is such an important topic in the Bible, if you took away God himself and the kingdom of heaven, you could call the Bible a financial book. So if it's that important to the Lord, shouldn't it be important to us? A second reason why we talk about money, and this is a very important reason, is because it's so easy to fall into idolatry. It's so easy to fall into idolatry when it comes to money. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root, and you can help me, of what? All evil. Love of money is the root of all evil. Notice it says the love of money, not money itself, because money is what we call amoral. It's neither good or bad, right? It's a tool. It's an object. But let me the first to say and admit, although I don't love money, I like it a lot. I like it a lot. It's just something that money does that other things can't do. Money has the power. I call it, it's a coverer. It has the power to cover your insecurities. If you weren't confident, you get a little money and you're confident. I've seen money transform people's physical attributes. People that didn't look good before, Lord Jesus. Before money. After money, they look amazing. But money has a way of uncovering things you didn't even know about yourself. It's when I had a little money, I found out I'm a little bougie. I remember me and my wife, we went to um, an all-inclusive, I forgot where we went. It was all-inclusive and it was all-inclusive. You pay a little extra and you get all these amenities and things that you get for being all-inclusive and they give you a little, you know, green, you know, wristband. And I remember they, they close you off and you have your own little section and you're in the all-inclusive club. And then I remember that sometimes people try to go, be, you know, in the line and they don't have the wristband and they try to come and talk to you and be a part of the club and they're trying to talk to me and I'm talking to them. But as soon as I finish talking to them, I go right to security. <laughs> he don't belong here. <laughs> he don't got the band. Right? Money does something to you. Money has a way of making you, changing your appetite. When you didn't have money, you weren't hungry. But as soon as you get a little bit of money, it's like, is that your beans open? I don't know. But the greatest thing and the biggest tool that money has, it, it, it gives you access. It gives you access to places that you normally would not have access to. That's why the, the church tries to use money as a tool to get into access so we could have the kingdom of God be in places that it normally would not be in if it were not for the access that money gives us. That's why you should always pray for humble 
mature Christians who have the gift of prosperity, or I should say wealth accumulation, so they could go into the doors that people that don't have access to it, they could speak on behalf of people that are locked out. That's why I pray, listen, it's counterculture. I pray for humble, rich Christians. And people would look at me funny, be like, a Christian, are they allowed to be? Listen, our, our forefather Abraham, he was wealthy. It's not money that's the problem, it's your heart. And without wealthy, humble Christians, there are things that the kingdom of God needs to do that we would not be able to do without wealthy Christians. And so that's why it's so hard to serve God and not have the right perspective about our finances. Because when you have money, you're great, but when you don't, you worry. And the verse that we just read is a perfect example of when you have the wrong mindset, how you could miss out on what God is trying to tell you. Uh, let, let's go really quickly. Uh, verse 14 through 21, I'm going to paraphrase it. So the disciples are going on a trip with Jesus. It's a, it's a Jesus mission trip, if you will. His, his, his tour, if you will. He's going around saving people and healing people and preaching the gospel. And they're going on a trip and they get on a boat. But as they are traveling, they forgot to bring sufficient amount of bread. They only have one loaf of bread for about 13 or 14 of them, theologians say, in that boat. Now, I know what you're thinking. How are they worrying about what they are going to eat when they have Jesus Christ on the boat? But that's what money will do to you when you are trying to follow God. Even though you have the Savior of Savior and the King of King who owns a cattle on a thousand hills, when you don't have enough provision, you start to argue with each other. You start to point fingers at each other. You start to decide, why, why didn't you bring enough bread? Don't you know that we have to make this bread last? You start to think of new ideas. How can I get bread? And they started to argue amongst each other. While they're arguing, the Bible says Jesus tries to tell them spiritual instructions and warnings. He said, why are you arguing about that bread? Why are you trying to figure out how to get more bread? Watch out for the Pharisees. Watch out for the Herod. Basically, he's trying to say, hey, don't be like the Pharisees. They're hypocrites. They show their righteousness in public. Don't be like Herod. He's always looking for a sign. But they still thought Jesus was talking about the bread. And, and you know it's frustrating to God when he's trying to get your attention and give you instructions, but you're focused about the wrong thing. Money has an ability to make us focus about the wrong thing and not hear from God. And what's amazing, you could see how frustrated God is because he started doing math problems. You know somebody's mad when they start asking you math problems. And he says this, and, and, and he starts off by saying, you don't have a money problem, you got a heart problem. When you are worried about your finances and you're trying to follow God, and you're worrying about your finances, it's not a money problem, you have a heart problem. Matter of fact, you have several problems. Jesus says, is your heart hardened? Are you deaf, do you not hear? Are you blind, do you not see? Or maybe you have amnesia and you've forgotten all the things I've done for you. He said, hey listen, didn't I just feed 5,000 people with five loaves? He started doing math problems, says, after I fed them, how many was left over? 12. He said, didn't I just feed 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread? After I've, I fed them, how many was left over? Seven. And so if you have one loaf of bread and there's like 12 of us in here, just give me a crumb. I'll feed the whole entire boat and overflow this whole boat. And so Jesus is trying to tell us, listen, don't ever forget what I've done for you when you're thinking about trying to go after the bread. I'll go exceedingly and abundantly in every way. And, I, I, and here's the truth of it. He's trying to tell us and teach us this financial truth. It's not what you have is what you have left over. I'm going to say it again. It's not about what you have in your bank. 
It's all about what you have left over. And if you're trying to play the game and, 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 and equate your wealth or your, how, how rich you are by what you have in your bank account, you are not playing the right game. If you're in the long game, you're thinking about what can I have left over? And so this morning, that was my long introduction. <laughs> this morning, I say all this. We have to right, have the right mentality. My subtitle, I introduce it to you now, is having a steward's mentality. Having a steward's mentality. So I will give you a few kind of mental thoughts, a few things that we do, because again, we want to love God. We, we want to follow God with our money. We want to love people with our money. We want to change the city with our money, but we need to have the right mentality. So let me begin by this quote. God created mankind not to be owners of anything, but to be stewards of everything. Entrepreneurs, don't run away from me yet. I'm going to say it again. God created mankind not to be owners of anything, but stewards of everything. How do you know that, Jonas? Okay, great. Go to Genesis 2.15. Genesis 2.15. Steward just means manager. We are managers, okay? Genesis 2.15 says, The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, You may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat, it, if you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Follow me. Mankind's first job was to manage something he did not create. Adam was created and put in the garden. He never planted a seed. He never watered a grass. He didn't do anything. He was put in the garden. He came naked onto the earth, not coming with any possession to his name. So if Adam would have ever told God or any of the animals, hey, you see that tree right there? That's my tree right there. You see those flowers right there? That's mine. All of creation would have known Adam was lying because you were lying. You weren't even there when daddy created all this. So that's where you have the shift with our thinking because we have a mindset of being an owner and God says, no, 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 no. You a steward. You don't owe nothing. And here's the danger of, and here's the difference between, I should say, an owner and a steward. The owner thinks he owns everything and he doesn't have to answer to nobody. The steward knows he knows nothing because he has to answer to God first. Here's, here's, here's the analogy. The steward knows everything that he or she has is on lease. If you know anything about leasing a car, you know that the car, you're making payments on it, but it's not technically yours. It belongs to the car dealer. And every time the car has a problem, you call them up. Hey, there's something wrong with your car. Y'all better come get this car. There's something wrong with it. Y'all solve the problem. Because he and she knows that after a certain period of time, they have to return that car back. But you also have an option to upgrade after you get it back. So we know that anything that we have from God, when he takes it back, we're just getting an upgrade. <laughs> Every time he takes our life, we're getting an upgrade to the new life in heaven. If he gives us, if he takes our job, we're going to upgrade to an even better job. So we don't have the pressure as steward to try to keep things that we don't own. God has it. The only pressure that the steward has is we have to manage what God gives us his way. The owner thinks he can manage it his way, but the steward knows that this ain't mine and I got to do it the way God wants me to do it. Here's how I know you can't manage it your way. God says, hey, here's this garden, take care of it, right? But you can't touch the tree right there. Don't touch it, don't eat it, or else you'll surely die. You know what scares me about some of our wonderful Christian entrepreneurs? Is that we think the ends justify the means. We would go into ungodly, unrighteous business acts and respect God to bless us for those unrighteous business acts. That's why Christians are so gullible sometimes to fall into so many get-quick-rich schemes. If you're in the street, I would say not all money is good money. 
Some of y'all came from the same neighborhood I came from, right? Because just because you can make money, you got to ask yourself, if I'm a steward of God and I'm taking care of God's finances, then I have to do it his way. I can't cut corners because if I do, God could take it away from me. And that's what happened to Adam. He did not obey. He did not manage the garden the way God wanted him to manage it. And he was kicked out of the garden. Some people ask me questions. Hey, why am I losing my business? Because you're a bad manager. Why did I lose my job? Because you're a bad manager. I am scared. Listen, on one point, I'm praying that we have humble, rich Christians. On another point, some of us, I pray God doesn't make you rich. You will destroy families. You will tear down the name of God because people said, well, he's a Christian and look how he did business. Oh, God must be like that. Stewards know that, hey, first of all, what I own is on lease, and I have to manage it God's way because it's for his name, not mine. It's not, about getting the, uh, it's not about getting all the money I could get. It's about glorifying his name, right? So that's the mentality of a steward. The steward also know he has responsibilities with God's finances. Twelve minutes. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Here, here, here's, here's the budget. Here, here we go. The steward has to budget. Has to budget. Luke 14, verses 28 to 30. It says, but don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. And then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. What does this all mean? This means as a steward, you have to know this. What's your net worth? A student has to know what he's working with. If you don't know what a net worth is, net worth is really simple. It's basically your assets minus your liability, right? Assets are cash, things that you own, your house, your furniture, things like that. Liabilities is debt that you're making payment on, right? So that student loan, that's a liability, right? All those, that car that you love, that's a liability because you're still making, making payments on it, right? You, you, you must know what is your net worth. So the way you find that out is you take your assets, what you own, minus your debts. Here's a quick news flash. Most people living in the United States, I would dare to say the world, is on a negative net worth and we think we are rich if you have more liabilities than you have assets you are in debt but at least you know how much it is if you don't know your net worth you do not have a foundation to work on a key quick way to find out what's your net worth and keep track of that is a wonderful tool. Go to www.personalcapital.com. www.personalcapital.com. If you go there, you could put in all your assets and all your liabilities, and it'll calculate that for you. Here's a key, key wonderful quote about budgeting. It says, if you don't control your money, your money will control you. If you don't tell your money where to go, your money will tell you where to go. So if you don't know your foundation, where you're starting off, your net worth. Listen, any company that don't know their net worth is out of business by tomorrow. Another key responsibility of a steward is to get out of debt. Proverbs 22, 7, write this down. Proverbs 22, 7, just as the rich ruler, just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrowers is servants to the lender. Just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servants to the lender. The system is to make you a borrower, not someone that's out of debt. Listen, the world system tries to detach you from relationship with your money. Look at how things are going right now. First, we used to have a barter system, right? 
where you would exchange things. Then we moved to gold and silver. Then we had cash, right? So money was something physical and tangible. By the way, when's the last time you actually touched physical currency? Just think about that. When's the last time you actually touched physical currency? It's because they're trying to detach you from relationship with your finances. And if you're detached physically and numbers is, money is just numbers floating around in the air, it's hard for you to budget. And you could get stuck in a game of always borrowing because you don't have a relationship with your money. So he gets out of debt. Can the church say amen? Also, too, he invests. Ecclesiastes 11.2 says, But divide your investment among many places, for you do not know what risks might lie ahead. Again, what we say is not how much you have is how much you have left over. Now we get to the fun part. How do we follow God with our finances? Note the key word is follow. Because with God... We didn't say love God with our finances. We say follow God with our finances because following means obedience. If God would take the five love language uh, tests, his love language would be obedience. He says, if you don't obey me, how can you say you love me? So we want to follow God with our finances. That means that we have to receive instruction. And when anything follows God, it grows. If you feel that financially God is not blessing you, maybe your finances is not following God. So we want to follow God with our money. How do we do that? Wonderful question. The first thing we know, again, we have a steward's mentality. We don't own nothing. We're leasing everything. We got to manage it. So the first thing God wants us to do is to honor him with our finances. Amen. Honor him with our finances. Malachi 3.10, we just read that. So we give him a tithe, a quick, quick understanding of a tithe. In the Old Testament, tithing was a mandatory thing, right? It was a mandatory thing. Even though in the New Testament it's not mandatory, the church still used the principles, okay? And just to give you a quick understanding, they had several tithes. They had the Levitical tithes that was there for the Levites, which were the priests and the, and the, and the musicians, those that served in the temple. You had your, your, your festival tithe, which was for the Feast of the Tabernacle, where they would have to remember what God did for them, and it took them out of Egypt. Let's just pause for the cause. God says, make sure y'all put in your budget tithe to have a party, to have a good time, just to remember what I did for you. Make sure we have a party for all the great things. Maybe we should do that for TKC. Please email Pastor David at tkci.org. But he says, have money is set for that. And then you had something called the charity tithe, which was happened twice every seven years. And you would take care of the widows and you would take care of the orphans and, and indentured servants would be let go during that time. It, we would call it the year of Jubilee, which is another subject for another time. But you would have three tithes that approximated about 23% of their finances. 23%. So 10% is not the bar for kingdom people. That's the foundation. Don't give yourself a pat on the back because you have arrived when you give 10% to the church. If it hurts, say ouch. I'm not trying to judge anybody, but that's just what I'm seeing in the Bible. It is a base. Right? We want to go above that, but that's okay. Just the fact that you honor God means that he's going to bless the 90%. So, 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 so even though it wasn't mandatory in the, in the New Testament, the principles still say the same. And I, I want to say this. Uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 9-11 says, Since we have planted spiritual seed among you, aren't we entitled to harvest a physical food or drink? 1 Corinthians 9, 13 says, In the same way the Lord ordered that those who preach the good news should be supported by those who benefit from it. Listen, this is kingdom finances I'm talking about. Even though the tithe isn't mandatory, we still have widows. We still have the poor. We still have people in the community. community. We still have pastors and ministers. So what Paul is saying is, listen, if, if, if I'm giving you spiritual truths, and I'm benefiting you spiritually. 
can I not benefit a little bit from earthly gain? And again, I'm telling you, you're going to reject this, but this is just the kingdom. If a doctor could save your physical life and he gets paid all this money, your pastor is bringing you the truths that would lead you into eternal security. He's saving your soul. How much is that worth? And I understand where we are in a society, but I'm just saying, don't be mad at me. Kingdom is talking. The kingdom says, you go ahead and you support God's people. Don't leave them neglected because they are the ones that should be focused on. The pastor sometimes has to work two or three jobs because you know why? They don't want to be labeled as a thief. They don't want to trust the church with their income because they have a family too. But if he gets any type or she gets any type of income, then they are a thief. But the, the Bible says that we must support our people. We must support our pastors, our ministers, our widows. Oh, man. Oh, man. Here we go. So um, I'm going to skip a couple things here. So love people with with your money. How do we love people with your money? This is a real great verse. Genesis 2.24. Genesis 2.24. It's the marriage verse. It's the marriage verse. It says, this, um, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. So we see here that we love people, and the first people that we should love with God's money is our spouse. It says, the two shall become one. Becoming one is not just in spiritual or in physical, but also in financial. There's a lot of spouses today, husbands and wives, after this sermon, you need to tell your husband or your wife, you need to run me that money. The steward knows that what they have is not just for them alone, but also for their family. A couple of things, and shout out to the marriage enrichment team. We, there's some of the notes I'm going to talk about right now come from a session that we just had. So what we want to do is we, don't, we, we could be spiritually equally yoked, but financially unequally yoked. Because one person has an owner mentality, and the other person has a steward's mentality. One person says, this is my money. The other person says, this is our money. When you get married, there is no longer my money or your money. It's our money. Oh, y'all not talking to me. So that means that once we become one, I have access to all that you own. And you have access to all that I own. It's quiet in the room. So what we, we, we believe as kingdom people, practical, we believe that if I'm able to share my body with you, then I should also be able to share my finances with you. If I can't do that, there is a problem. The world has confused us to tell us that we can have intimacy. There's kids in the room, but you only serious with them. Oh, she has your bank account information? Oh, y'all real now. As though our bodies are less important than our finances. Ugh five minutes <laughs> share your finances that's what we're talking about and, and we do it in many forms if if you don't have one account please for the love of God let your spouse have access to the other accounts now I will say it is a trust issue because if one person has a gambling problem you probably do not want to share your finances with that person but if the trust is built this is a kingdom mandate you are one and they should have access to your finances. Why should you do that? Number one, it's easier to keep account of one account than multiple account in your own name. Or at least have those multiple account be both of your names because God forbid something happens to you, they could get access to it as well. And also, it's easy to access. Number two, it prevents financial, and this is a word that you probably don't hear every day, it prevents financial infidelity. What is that? Financial infidelity happens more than um, the other kind of infidelity that we all know about. What does that look like? You think you're debt free, but your partner is spending money without you knowing and putting you into debt. 
And how many people know that it's sometimes it's harder to recover from financial infidelity than any other kind of infidelity. So it prevents that from happening. Another thing that we want to do about this, loving people, we, we love our spouses, but also, too, we, we, we love our children. The Bible instructs us to leave behind an inheritance. Proverbs 13, 22 said, good people leave an inheritance to their children, but the sinner's wealth passes to the godly. In other translations, it says a good man, not a great man, leaves an inheritance for his children's children. This is a practical, practical, practical thing you could do right now because I've done it for myself. You should start an IRA fund for your children. It's an individual retirement account. What is that? It's a retirement account that you could start investing right now and be in charge of and start investing because IRAs are post-tax. That means that the money is already taxed when you put in it and it doesn't um, take out taxes when you take money out. So this is how it looks. For their first, for my, my son, for his first birthday, I told my friends, I said, listen, gifts are great. Thank you so much for the gifts. But he's not going to remember any of that. Give me money. I'm going to put it in this retirement account. I'm going to start retiring him now. So when he gets of age, he'll have something that he knows his mom and dad has left for him and he's not going into the world naked. Come with me, come with me, come with me. And in, in, in Genesis that we read, we read that God did some reverse engineering. God, before he created Adam and Eve, he created the garden first. That means he created the environment for his children before he put them in so they, when they're in the garden, they'll have everything they need for them to succeed. Some of us, depending on the situation, not trying to judge anybody, but some of us blame our kids on why they are, they're, they're, they're not what we want them to be when we did not create an environment for them in the first hand for them to succeed. God is saying, create the environment first. What's your garden? What garden are you creating for your kids? As for me and mine, I want them to know that, hey, daddy and mommy, we got you. We got you. One of, one of, um, one of our, 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 our hopes is that we could buy an investment property. So every time one of our kids have some financial need or anything or, or, or times is tough with their family, they know mom and dad got a place for them to stay. They're never going to have to go homeless or, or, or go out in the street because we have to take care of our children. Amen. And another thing that we do is to change the city with our finances. Change the city with our finances. God says in Proverbs 19, 17, the word of God says, Proverbs 19, 17 says this, if you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord and he will repay you. If you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord and he will repay you. For all intensive purposes, Jesus was a person of the people, of the common people, for the downtrodden. He was a person for all people, but he had a focus on the poor. When, when you give to the poor, he says that, hey, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to repay you. TKC does a great job of helping the community alike. Um, that's why we have the touch, uh, the talk and touch and transform March 28th. Please be there. That's why we're doing what we're doing next week, because we know that we want to help out the community and God will repay us. But God will repay you in multiple ways, not just with more income, but with opportunities. Amen. And if you could have the picture Go ahead and throw it up if you had that picture for me, Gene. I just want to show this picture. Listen, <laughs> this is me, y'all. And a few weeks ago, I was just in a car accident. And God repaid me by saving my life and sparing my life. Listen, I was trying to hold my tears while I was in worship because the Holy Spirit was saying that, listen, let the people know when I repay them that I'm a God of protection. You can never outgive God. I can't afford not to give and trust God. If I trust God with my life, shouldn't I trust him with my finances? 
God says, like, listen, test me onto this. Trust me with your finances and see if I won't go above and exceedingly than what you imagine. Listen, I got a family. I got a wife. I got friends. I was not thinking of getting into an accident but the Lord. God says, look at, look at all that I've done. And for me to ever worry that my God who's able to protect me from a car accident <laughs> won't be there when the lights are off. That God won't be there when I don't have food or money to give to my kids. He's able to provide, y'all. If he is good to you, if you know this, can you give him a praise? Can you let them know how much you appreciate them? He is good. And it's a privilege. As a steward, you don't say, I have to give God my money. You say, I get to give God. Lord, take it all, Jesus. Whatever you do, don't do it without me. Because I know that you go exceedingly and above and beyond. Matter of fact, I, I dare you right now to just do the pay or forward challenge yourself. Just go to McDonald's or go somewhere and while you're in the cashier and about to pay for yourself, just tell the, the teller, like, you know what, the person behind me, I got them. Because they need to know that God got, got them. Amen. One of the wonderful things, and this is why it's so powerful when you live a life of generosity. All of us want to live the life to where, you know, you're in church and somebody talks about a need and, and, and they need the finances. You could just, if you're married, turn around to your spouse and just say, yeah, baby, we got that. We could write a check. We got that. Those are the fun things you could do when you live a steward's mentality. You could bless people and you could be a blessing to others because God has been a blessing to you. If you receive the word this morning, can you give God the praise? The power. Amen. At this time, we're going to not neglect the fact that there might be some people that do not know our Jesus Christ. That there might be some people hearing the sound of my voice that has not had the opportunity to give their lives to Jesus. We like to invite you right now and reintroduce you to the Savior of Saviors. I say reintroduce because God has known you your whole entire life. And he wants you to know that God is not a God that is angry at you, that is frowning and looking down from heaven, but he loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for your sins. And he wants to have a relationship with you. Is that you? Just go ahead and text the word Jesus to 47449-8884. That's Jesus to 47449-8884. And if you want to accept Jesus Christ into your life, you don't have to do anything. Just do that prayer in your heart and say, God, I accept you. I know I'm a sinner, but I know that you came and died for my sins, and I want to receive you today. And if it's that you, again, we would like to know you. Go ahead and text Jesus to that number, and we'll connect with you because we want to have life with you. Thank you so much, and God bless.